I'll just tell you a little bit about the format, what we're going to be doing now. And we have with us here uh, Doug Parr, he's Chief Scientist at Greenpeace. Morning to you, thanks for joining us. Also Kevin Anderson, Anderson Deputy Director of the Tyndall Centre, um, which studies uh, climate change, doesn't it? And he's also Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester. So quite a different take on what we had before. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and welcome. Um, I'm going to talk to them for ten minutes or so, uh, then I'm going to open questions to the floor. You gave some great questions last time, I'm sure you'll have similar questions again. Um, and then after that, um, just to make sure we have the punch and Judy, as uh, Francis mentioned earlier, um, Francis Egan uh, from Quadrilla will be back with us, Andrew Austin of iGas and also Dan Biles, so we can MP as well, so sitting here, um, so we can have a bit more of debate and sort of try and nail down a few things. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's been really interesting so far. We're going to start with um, Kevin, actually, first of all. And sort of talk in sort of general terms at the beginning. Um, so what is your principal concern um, with the role of shale gas within the UK? And then we'll look at the global level as well. OK. My, uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Uh, my principal concern with shale gas, which ex extends to actually many other fossil fuels, it's fair to say, is that we are committed, um, and as a democracy we're all committed here, to our international agreement to, to avoid dangerous climate change, which we have collectively decided as a represent or is represented by a two degree C rise in the global mean surface temperature. Now, this all sounds a bit prosaic, but actually this is really important because we've signed up to that and we've signed up to it and we will say we will sign up to it on the basis of science and consistent with, with um, concepts of equity. Then that puts obligations on us as a nation. And when we look at those obligations, how they play out, what that means is that we have a certain amount of carbon that we can consume in this country to meet our international obligations, which we have signed up to repeatedly, including again at Camp David Declaration, the G8 Camp David Declaration last year, where David Cameron and Obama both signed to, to, to hold to 2 degrees C. The implications of that are we do not have a carbon budget that would allow a new fossil fuel to enter it. We struggle to use the existing fossil fuels within that carbon budget. That is at a, at a global level and indeed at a UK level. So from, if we are not to renege on our international commitments, then shale gas has no role to play in a low carbon transition. We, and we should be direct and honest about that. If we think it's perfectly reasonable to renege on those commitments, then we may think there's a space for shale gas. But let's be, let's be blunt and honest when we start off this debate. Can you not, what, I mean, you know, just to expand on that a little bit, if you would. <clears throat> okay, we've signed up to this two degrees C, this avoid dangerous climate change yeah. on the basis of science. So we have a certain carbon cake that we can consume. And at the moment, we're pumping, in, uh, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere at uh, around about heading towards th 35 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. If we burn shale gas, which we continually hear is a low carbon fuel, bear in mind shale gas, as in all gas, is the mass of it is 75% carbon. It is not a low carbon fuel. Is also not lower than coal or oil, unless you don't burn the coal or oil. So remember, it's not a low carbon fuel unless you do not burn the other ones. Because the atmosphere doesn't care about where the CO2 comes from, it only cares about the total amount of CO2. So therefore, if we are going to burn shale gas, we have to guarantee we're going to keep other fossil fuels in the ground. I was talking to a chief executive, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that, I was talking to a very senior person in Shell last week who said that um, they are looking to exploit the Arctic. We recently had a vote in the Falklands, which wasn't all about citizenship, it was also about access to oil in that area. We are ripping up the wilderness in, in Canada to get tar sands out of the ground, and now it's shale gas. Which of these fossil fuels are going to keep in the ground? Is anyone going to shift anyone? Any of them to kept in? There is no intention by anyone in the fossil fuel industry, or indeed by governments, to not exploit every part of carbon they can get out of the ground and burn it. And shale gas is just another part of that story that makes the situation even worse in, worse in terms of climate change unless we find a way of locking the carbon um, into the atmosphere, uh, lo locking the carbon um, into the ground. So preferably keep the fossil fuels underground. Okay. Um, I'm sure okay. we'll pick up some of those, and I'm sure you'll have questions um, in a minute, <coughs> won't you? Um, right, so that's your, that's your view. And um, let's pick up on that point particularly, um, not a carbon, a low carbon fuel. How do you see it from Greenpeace? Uh, no, well, uh, can I bring him either? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I, I concur with a lot of what Kevin said, and um, I'd um, put that also in, I mean, Kevin is a, a great exponent of the arithmetic, and we do have to stick to the arithmetic when we're talking about something like climate change. Um, I'm also concerned about the way in which um, shale gas is, uh, frankly, distorting political debate in the UK, um, so that... Um, I am seeing things said about the potential for shale gas and how we should use it, um, which is somehow suggesting that it, is a, a, it should supplant 
um, our low carbon commitments. What I don't see is anybody articulating in a remotely credible way the sort of points that Kevin was making. Shale gas is an unconventional, uh, is an unconventional gas source. It is adding to the amount of uh, accessible carbon that is available uh, through fossil fuels. I don't see how finding it and potentially exploiting it is going to leave other fossil fuels in the ground. I concede it's not impossible that under certain policy arrangements which would have international reach and international force that that is a conceivable outcome. But not only do I not see that happening, I don't see anybody in the industry remotely trying to grapple with it. So as far as I'm concerned, shale gas is adding to the problem that we're already in. And just in, any ca in case anybody's thinking that, well, you know, shale gas, of course, we've got to deal with this now and, and we can deal with these other things, this other climate change business down the road. Those radical eco-hippie lefties, the World Bank, last week produced a report pointing out how damaging climate change is potentially going to be because we're headed for a four degree temperature rise which will leave literally billions in water scarcity potentially with other issues like uh, like uh, like well straightforward hunger as well as d uh, disease and sea level rise that will impact on people all of which will affect the uk just because we're in a globalized world these are not things that can be postponed and done later because once carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere to all intents and purposes on any kind of human time scale, that's it. It's there. And we can't go back on it. We can't deal with it later. We have to deal with these emissions and get the, the trajectories and political trajectories right now. Um, Kevin, can we just do the, um, if, you, if you like the numbers, um, shale, you, you, you've made it very clear that you don't think it is a low carbon fuel. How does shale, though, compare to, for example, coal? If, you use, if you're going to use shale gas in power generation, or if you're using gas in power I mean, shale gas and gas are the same thing, as, as, as everyone here knows. I mean, so they just come out of the ground in a slightly different form, a uh, slightly different uh, technique for getting it out of the ground, but it's the same stuff. Um, if you use compared coal with uh, gas used in the power station, then roughly it halves the amount of carbon dioxide. So, so it is better? Less worse, it's certainly not better. Right. There's a big difference. <laughs> La language is really important in these things. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Yep. A good kicking is better than the mugging, but neither of them are good. Um, go on, so continue with the thought, though. So, um... so, so therefore, um, sh shale gas, though it is lower, 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 is lower carbon, it is mm -hmm. better or less worse than coal, we will still be burning the coal. Unless, I mean, if we put in a policy, a regime that says we are going to deliberately lock in other fossil fuels, so if Dan can persuade the government to say we won't, we won't exploit oil from the North Sea, then I'll come on Dan's side. I still struggle with the maths, but I'll broadly come on Dan's side. But there's no intention within the government to try and keep oil in the North Sea and use shale gas instead. So uh, at the moment, no one, no one is actually playing out the numbers in, any, uh, in anything other than a very rhetorical, and I would argue, dishonest fashion. And I would extend that slightly further. There was a lot of discussion previously um, about issues of local communities. Well, the local community to shale gas, to me, are the 30 million people that live within one metre sea level rise of, of, the, of the coastal strip of Bangladesh. These are people who are the local communities. So everyone spoke before about parishes and communities in the UK. Um, and OK, you know, and we'll get some economic benefit from it, so we might get a new community hall or whatever it might look like. Um, but the people on the coastal ships of Bangladesh or the vulnerable people in some of the poorer parts of the world will actually be hit by the impacts of yet another fossil fuel. So when we think about this from an equity point of view, when we think about it from a community point of view, let's be honest about who those communities are, or be honest again and say we just don't care about them. Um, so as far as you two are concerned, and you know, as again, this is a very different point of view from what we were hearing earlier, there is no place then for, 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 for shale gas or how would you see it placed within the energy needs of the, you know, the very real energy needs of this country? Okay, well, um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, what I see is um, that we should be um, taking a very marked change of direction um, in looking to support um, sustainable renewable uh, generation. Um, we need to do, be much more radical on energy efficiency and treat it as infrastructure uh, in terms of the building stock. Um, 
and that those need to be the direction of travel in order to, to get us there. Uh, but what I see going on is a sort of fetishizing of what's gone on on the, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic in completely different conditions and with um, quite possibly um, different geology, I don't think we know yet. Um, uh, to say that, um, we're going to do the same thing here and it's going to have the, somehow it's going to have the same effect and, we, uh, and everything's going to be wonderful. And I don't remotely see that as a, as a credible scenario. We're going to let you come back on that shortly, you two. OK, <laughs> go on. Well, I just think it's interesting to note that we've recently given £350 billion, £350 billion to the people that caused the problem in the first place that were seen economically, the bankers. Where's the money? £350 billion could have, could have set in train a retrofit programme for every single house in the UK that will still be here in 2050. There are 26 million houses in the UK and probably 20 million of, the, of them will still be here in 2050. We could have been retrofitting every single one of those properties over the next 10 to 20 years. Now that retrofit agenda would have, would have helped with employment, it would have helped with low skilled labour, it would have helped with the economy. Okay. Instead, but that was, that's, a yeah. low, that's a low carbon agenda. When you talk about yeah. the energy problem in the UK, that's a, that's a low carbon um, response. To, to this issue, using existing resources that we have. So I think we have everything we have we need to resolve the energy uh, problem that we are finding ourselves in, except for courage and innovative thought. Can I just add that, um, I mean, the way in which this, this is being talked about within government, and it's, it's almost as if there's two different energy policies going on. There's one that's, that's, that's rooted in the, the, the low carbon agenda, and there's, and there's one that seems to be being driven by, um, well, the Chancellor is the, uh, uh, George Osborne seems to be the, the kind of figurehead for it. It is damaging investor confidence in, in the, uh, the renewable technologies that UK could lead the world in. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, there were some um, companies who were gung-ho for uh, putting investments in, uh, uh, into the UK and now they're sitting on their hands until they've got some clarity. So um, I'm not blaming people in this room for that, um, but you must appreciate the consequences of what is being done and how this is being used politically to, to, to undermine an alternative energy strategy which is, which is much more sustainable. Um, what about that investment on renewables? Is the focus, do you think, being taken away as far as you see it? I think it's hard to say at the moment whether that's the case, but I, th I mean, I just come back to sort of the basic practicalities. If you've got five pounds to spend and you're spending it on one thing, you haven't got it to spend on another. So the, again, I think the maths play out here that if you are an investment company, you want to invest in energy, and you invest your money that you have to invest in one thing, you can't invest it in another. So I'll let you draw, you know, draw your own conclusions. That and, and, you know, short of magic, you can't you can't actually you know, invest in two things with the same amount of money at the same time. Mm. Um, so you look, you, I mean, you're talking about what you do with houses and all the rest of it. Where, what about, for example, let's put another you know elephant in the room: nuclear into this. This then, what, what's your view on that from your, your, your two? You two? Um, I, I'm pretty agnostic about nuclear power. Um, it's, it's certainly low carbon, it's expensive, but then I think by and large we don't know the costs of most of the energy sources. Um, so it's, it is expensive to build, it's gen, gen, relatively cheap to build, it has it's a very cheap, relatively cheap to run, it has a lots of other implications. Um, but, the, but from a low carbon agenda, it's certainly, it certainly is low carbon. It's the building problem, it's not just the expensive, it takes a long time to construct. You have to get through planning, but the actual construction of them is much more complicated than, the, than a simple gas um, combined cycle gas turbine. So um, it could be part of the mix. Probably for the UK, I go slightly further and say that I don't think this is something. This is made some of my colleagues may disagree with me on this, but um, I would take the view that it probably shouldn't be part of the UK's mix simply because there are constrained supplies of uranium 235. And if we are serious about climate change at the level at which we sign up to internationally, other parts of the world that don't have the wonderful renewable regime we have in the UK. Um, we'll have to find alternative low carbon options and there are, there are basically three types of renew, um, low carbon options. There's, there's um, nuclear, renewables and biomass and biofuels, let's call them renewable if they're done sustainably. But they're the only ones that are there. Carbon capture and storage can't get, the, can't get the emissions down low enough. So even if you have carbon capture and storage, you're only talking about 50 to 80, probably 50 to 80 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour generated. That is not enough to meet our carbon budgets. So again, the maths are important in this. So this comes back to my point. I'm agnostic about nuclear, but I think other parts of the world may have to use it to meet their own carbon targets. So we shouldn't be using it here. Uh, I just say we, we are opposed to nuclear, uh, have been for a long time. Um, that remains the case. Uh, I think the challenge about <coughs> excuse me, um, 
about low carbon remains. It means a you know constant point of discussion. Um, but um, we also see the same kind of dynamics going on uh, around the political impact of uh, of nuclear, um, as uh, to a much lesser to a different extent we do around shale gas. I mean, look at the current energy bill. Um, we wanted to find um, we wanted new investors in the in the power sector uh, we wanted uh, to find more liquidity we wanted new independent players um, to reduce the dominance of the big six uh, energy companies um, and yet the uh, the independent renewable generators are still desperately having conversations with the deck to see how they can make the energy bill arrangements work for them uh, whereas nuclear is perfectly happy now that seems to me to be completely arse about face um, if you say what if you look at what is what the, the apparent stated objectives of the energy bill were it was not to encourage nuclear it was to um, it was to help uh, the independent renewable sector and Actually, it's the other way around. Um, more generally, I mean, I think if, if, if you think nuclear is going to be a global solution, then you have to be com comfortable with the idea of, uh, of nuclear in um, you know, Nigeria, the Sahel, Afghanistan. If you're not comfortable with that, don't think that it's a global solution. Um, you, you talk very much about, the sort of, particularly you, Kevin, about um, the sort of global solutions um, or global impact. What about sort of impact as well of fracking on a local level? What, what, would, your, what would you say about that? As far as you say that. Yeah. Um, well, I think there have been a whole range of concerns raised, um, whether it's to do with uh, uh, water quality, groundwater, well integrity, you know, you can air pollution, you know, you can rattle them all off. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's impossible to deal with those. Um, whether they will be dealt with, I think, is a much more tricky question to answer. Um, so for the UK, um, we've got an environment agency that's been cutting it, had to cut its staff by about uh, 2,000, had a major, uh, major cut in uh, its uh, uh, central grant. Uh, by about a quarter, pro probably more after the, uh, the announcements tomorrow. Um, and they've got to take on a whole new uh, regulatory regime. Now, um, so if, and, and it, it, you know, for me it is still very much an if, um, shale gas were to, were to start developing in the UK, then, uh, then you know, they would be responsible for trying to make sure that every single, uh, every single well was properly looked after and maintained, as well as the responsibilities that sit with DEC and, uh, and those with the HSE. So, my question is not, is it possible to do it right? My question is whether it will. And as I say, that's a lot more complicated and more difficult question to answer. Um, I'm just looking at the US model, because there are people who say that they have lower emissions now because of shale gas. What's your response to that? The climate doesn't care. The climate only cares about the total amount of CO2 emissions. So, so it doesn't U care because it's happening in other places or because it's... Be because exactly as Dan pointed out before, because we, our emissions went up last year because we were burning the American coal that they are no longer burning, then the climate just says, hey, more CO2. So it doesn't matter about the emissions going down in one country. That's the problem. If the UK adopts a shale gas industry, then that will affect the fossil fuel prices around the globe, and which effectively, if we produce our own shale gas, as, as Dan points out, if the markets broadly work, then the price of other fossil fuels, certainly gas, may well drop, and which means that other people can burn more of it. Now, I'm not necessarily against poor power parts of the world developing faster. In fact, I think they should develop faster and their emissions will go up. But that means that in countries like ours, we have to get our emissions down even faster. Okay, um, lots to think about there and lots of, we will have responses from um, Dan as well shortly. Um, <coughs> questions to the floor, I'm sure, yes, I can see smiles at least, go on. Do, um, yeah, feel free to ask questions and then we'll um, bring the others on in a minute. Yes, yeah, so John Baldwin, CNG Services. It's a question for Kevin, really. In the last five years since we've seen a large growth in shale gas production in, in the US, the production of coal, the actual production of coal, has reduced by 160 million tonnes a year. Now, to put that in context, Drax uses about 10 million tonnes. So shale gas has effectively stopped 16 Drax worth of coal being produced. So it's not been exported to, to Europe because our carbon prices are low. It's actually left in the ground. And I think with luck, Obama will reinforce that and we can have the, the carbon capture and storage we need, which is coal can stay underground. The only way you can have coal can stay underground is shale gas 160 million tonnes and I think 
Kevin, you quite often put misleading statements out and you shouldn't really do it. I think you should be reporting that shale gas in America has left 160 million tonnes of coal every year in the ground. So that's this year. Next year it'll be 160 million, the year after 160, and you should be reporting that. And you should, your, your, your view on shale gas is not quite right, it's 180 degrees wrong. And I think you need to go away, look at some facts, and revisit your opinions. Well, Would you let us pick up? Yeah, well, I, I thank you very much for his categorical facts. Um, you, uh, I look forward to seeing your paper that says categorically, because it's obviously it's clearly a fact, that that 160 million tonnes of coal has remained in the ground because of shale gas, because you just made that factual statement. Um, it probably remained in the ground for a range of reasons, one of which may have been shale gas. But that's a much more nuanced response to these issues and clearly isn't a, a ca categorical, simple fact. Um, so, yes, shale gas, this coal may have remained in the ground, and I would agree with you completely. If we can find a way of locking the coal into the ground, if we can guarantee that the coal producers um, in, in the US will not produce that coal out of the ground in the future, because, of course, if you lock it in this year, but you get extra out next year, it doesn't work. Um, if that's the case, then I'm completely with you. But let's be a bit more, let's be a bit more subtle in our choice of facts, and the way that we, not our choice of facts, but the way that we actually apply those facts and consider those facts. This is a much more nuanced issue, that clearly that the UK has, the, the US has been exporting coal that it may otherwise have combusted. Now, that doesn't, it's not all due to shale gas. There could be other reasons in there as well to do with the economy. But shale gas does appear to be one of the reasons why the US has probably been exporting some additional coal. Um, and it is now one of the major... Well, it always has been, but it's, I think it's moved up one notch now as, um, in terms of its position as a major coal exporter. But if, as you say, we can lock it into the ground, I'm all for doing that. Um, but let's be a bit more careful with our choice and our um, uh, blunt use of facts. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that as well, or you? Yep. Well, cool. I mean, I, I can do. Yes. I mean, as Kevin says, the, um, what that's meant is that is that coal becomes cheaper, and it will, as far as I can see, continue to become cheaper. So, if the objective is to somehow keep coal locked in the ground in a in an essentially free market of fossil fuels, whilst and we endlessly keep exploiting more and more gas in order to um, try and keep gas cheaper than coal. Oh, well, you know, we postpone apocalypse for a couple of years. But, it, you know, in the end, it's about, as Kevin said, locking it in the ground. And I don't see anything in US policy that's going to keep it there. Next up, anybody? Definitely. Hi, Emily from The Telegraph. Um, just a question for Doug from Greenpeace. Um, what's Greenpeace's strategy for making sure that the shale gas doesn't get uh, taken out of the ground in the UK? I mean, are we going to expect to see Greenpeace campaigning against every single planning permit that any of these companies put in? Are you going to be actively kind of at all the sites protesting against it? What, what's the strategy and what's the kind of argument you'll be making to, to communities when they come to consider these planning applications? Well, all of those would be in the mix. Um, you know, yes, of course, we are uh, continuing to be concerned about the uh, uh, about potential shale gas exploitation. You may be aware we, uh, we staged um, uh, a little demo of what it might be like in George Osborne's constituency uh, not that far from here. Um, I would say um, that objections to planning permits possibly, um, you know, working with communities, possibly. Um, I actually don't know, and that's not a diplomatic answer. Uh, I mean, it's true, if I did know, I couldn't tell you, but actually I don't know, um, because we haven't decided. So, but all of those would be, would be on the agenda, I think. <coughs> okay. Dick Moorman, I'm with Siemens. Um, I agree with Kevin's first point that carbon doesn't care whether it comes from oil, gas or coal. Um, I have a problem with the, with the other points that you made. Um, I think uh, you make it sound as if by using shale gas we increase carbon, but I don't think that we increase that because we don't increase the consumption. It, it, it's just a different consumption. If you use uh, shale gas, you do away with coal with coal, as we've just been saying. And I think the focus should be here, not on the producers, but on the consumers of energy. Uh, much more efficiency, uh, greater savings by increasing. Look at, for instance, uh, gas turbines or other large machines. Gas turbines about 35% efficient. That's pretty poor. 
our car engines or trucks and vans 25% efficient. Science should work on these areas to try to improve the efficiency of our consumption. That will bring carbon down, wouldn't it? Um, I partly agree with you um, there. I think it's absolutely essential that we do, we do focus on efficiency, but let's be blunt about it. We're a lot more efficient now than we were in the 1900s, um, and we consume a lot more energy, and we emit a lot more CO2. So efficiency in itself doesn't generally mean that you see a reduction in either energy consumption or carbon emissions, because you get a rebound effect. Now, you can put policy mechanisms in place to, to alleviate that, um, and I think we need, to, we need to actually do that. So I, I agree with part of, your, part of your, uh, your claims or your statement there, but I'd also to come back to the point that unless we do put in place policies to keep other fossil fuels in the ground, then shale gas is just an addition to the other fossil fuels. And we have no, there is no evidence to suggest at the moment that we're going to be, we have a, a significant either UK or global policy to keep other fossil fuels in the ground. So in the absence of that, shale gas is an addition of carbon dioxide, not a substitute. Anybody like to take that on? Anybody? Go on. Did you want to follow up on that? Are you okay? Okay. Graham Dean from REACH. Um, could, if we don't do shale gas, uh, could you say a bit more about what the country should do for its energy supplies? Um, yeah, well, I, I outlined the direction of travel earlier. Um, I want to distinguish here between uh, that I'm not saying that we won't be using gas. Um, because we will be using gas, and um, I, I think the question is the role of that gas in the in the transition to a genuinely low carbon um, um, system. So we'll be using gas in heating. We'll be using uh, gas as a balancing fuel in um, uh, in the power system. Um, at the moment, I would say one of the best available technologies for our industry is actually to have industrial CHP, and that will, for the moment, be gas-fired, um, just because it uses the gas uh, that much more efficiently. So I see a role for gas, um, and I see a, a, a major and increasing role for renewables as the bulwark of the system as we move towards 2030, uh, with gas as the balancing role. This, this is quite a... Quite a, a complex, it's a quick question, but quite a complex one to really unpick. Um, current consumption in the UK, I think, is, yeah, I'm not, this is the approximate figures, about 2,000 terawatt hours. Other people here will know much better than me what the exact number is. So about 2,000 terawatt hours is our current energy consumption in the UK. Electricity consumption is about 370 terawatt hours. I think that's about right. I think if anyone disagrees, please, please see their numbers. Um, my estimate, and, and some of my colleagues' work, and this is quite provisional work, is that we could probably do roughly the things we do today with somewhere like 50 to 70 percent less energy. I mean, we're having this event today with the lights on and the sun shining outside. Now, okay, we may not be rocket scientists, but most of us have heard of windows. There are things that we can actually do to reduce our emissions very significantly with existing technologies. Look at the, the average car driving around in the UK. It emits somewhere about 165 grams of carbon per kilometre. We sell internal combustion engine cars now, and even if you like those sort of fast things that blokes like, like BMWs, they sell a car, a bog standard diesel car, that does about 109 grams. And there are plenty of other cars now in the 85 to 100 gram mark. So with existing technologies, with no price premiums, if you go across the board on this, you can do the same thing with refrigerators if you want to, or, or lighting in this room. Uh, you go across the board, there are probably savings I would say of somewhere between 50 to 70 percent. Now, if you see that happening, you can drop your 2,000 terawatt hours to the sorts of numbers you could probably meet with electricity. Then you have to say, well, what are you going to do to generate that electricity? Now, that some of it won't be generated by electricity. Flying planes by electricity is, is, a, is a tad challenging. Um, but there are lots of other things we can do with it. So then you say, what, how do you generate that electricity? It would seem to me, from the, from the figures that are out there, and of course not, not, not enough has been done on this, that we could probably do that in the UK from the use of renewables. I still think this would be very challenging within our current, well, not our current economic growth model, but probably fit perfectly well with, but with the model that we were aiming for in terms of, in terms of increased economic growth. But it's still, I think, I think we have to play with those numbers and look at them. If you look at things like seven barrage, seven, eight gigawatts, something like that, if you take the very wide um, seven barrage that pretty much goes from Pembroke to Cornwall, you might get some of the ocean waves in there and, and out, out towards 20 odd gigawatts. These are awful things from a sustainability perspective, but I think we may have to do them from a carbon perspective. I think we probably have sufficient carbon supply, uh, low carbon, almost zero carbon supply from renewables in the UK if we start to make that transition now and allied it with a, with a radical shift in our energy consumption. So I think those two would broadly come together with some really major system challenges in that. The dynamics of that would be yeah, hugely challenging. But hey, 1969, we arrived on the moon. We're in 2013 now. Perhaps we should start to think differently. Um, it, it's, not just, it's not just system challenges, is it? No, 
it's not just system challenges. I mean, massive challenges in terms of equity. Most people in the UK do not consume much energy. Those of us in this room are all massive energy consumers. So and there are big issues for equity, I agree. Um, that it's a good change of perception as well, isn't it? Oh, it's a big change of perception. I think this is, this is a part of my concern about shale gas. What shale gas is doing, and it's not shale gas's fault, this is, but what it does, it, it locks us in still further to our existing infrastructure, to our existing way of thinking. So it doesn't allow us to start to think differently. So I think there are, as you say, there are perception issues, there are intellectual issues, there are system, that, and they play out as, as practical, physical um, issues in terms of infrastructure that are really pivotal here. So you know, shale gas, and I don't really want to pick on it, this is, in that sense, just a shale gas, but shale gas is, is emblematic of... A, a, of a conscious lock-in, or maybe an unconscious lock-in, to the ways that we do things, and we need to do things differently. Can it not be a transition? Uh, yes, if you want to renege on two degrees C, so let's be honest right. about it. If we want to say, we, we don't abide by international commitments, then that's fine. But if we want to abide by international commitments, let me see the maths, and I don't think it can be a transition. Not, oh, sorry, not... Not for the wealthy parts of the world. Let's be blunt. Uh, uh, for the poorer parts of the world, they have a bigger carbon budget because they haven't consumed as much yet. So for some of the poorer parts of the world, shale gas may well be a transition fuel in those, those parts of the world, but not in the wealthy parts of the world. Do I have anything to say? Go on. Next question. At the back. Oh, I'll come to you in a minute. There's somebody behind you. Yes, Matt Lambert from Quadrilla. Um, you're talking mainly about energy, uh, electricity generation there, and you're agreeing, I think, that uh, you can see gas as a transition field, but not, I think, you're saying for this country. Um, we all know that, uh, you know, 80% of homes or thereabouts, possibly more, use gas for heating, for cooking. Where do you propose that we get that from renewables and what time scale are you talking about people ditching their boilers and their gas hobs and so on? Um, or would you rather see shale gas imported from the United States, brought over as liquefied national gas from the United States and, uh, you know, put back into the system at terminals in Wales and what's, what's the uh, carbon cost of that, please? Um, uh, you require, domestic heating is... Uh, now Total, total heating use in the UK is about 800 terawatt hours. Um, of that, I think about 450 terawatt hours, again, someone else can correct me if that's wrong, about 450 terawatt hours, which is more than our total grid supply, um, is domestic heating. Um, as, as someone else from Quadrilla, actually, one of your colleagues in Quadrilla pointed out before, and he, wondered, he was American, I think it was certainly North American, when he wanders around the UK and he sees single glazed windows getting put in, um, or the quality of our, our buildings, then he, he, he can see why we are consuming so much energy in things like heating. So I think there's a huge amount we could actually do on the infrastructure level. I come back to my point before, we spent £350 billion pounds handing it out to the foxes that guard the chicken coop. We should have handed it out to people to do retrofit to those properties, which I think would have reduced the energy consumption probably to well below 100 terawatt hours. Once you drop below 100 terawatt hours, you can probably add that to the grid. So you can probably do domestic, domestic heating on the grid. You'd probably be talking about 2030. This would be a radical shift um, uh, with existing properties particularly, but I think it's something, again, if we're serious about 2 degrees C, it is both within our resource potential and our current technologies to do that. Um, but at the moment, again, we're, we're not either have the courage to do it um, or prepared to look at the technologies that do exist. Uh, just to say, in terms of the policy direction, the, uh, the government has actually now got a reasonable strategy on heat, um, which it hasn't had for quite a long time, um, which is that the, um, the rural areas and the off-gas grid are being converted to, uh, or the, uh, the objective, rather, is to move them to um, uh, heat pumps or um, electrification because they're actually electrically heated to a significant degree anyway, or, or you know, they're using oil, which isn't great at all from any perspective, including price. Um, and that the, the denser urban areas are to move to uh, district heating, which has some fuel use gains, even um, if in the short term that continues to be gas. Um, but as a, a transition can be made, um, then those district heating schemes can be provided by a variety of other fuels, uh, including biogas, including uh, the more difficult um, electrical forms of heat pumping, um, including, in certain cases, waste to energy. Um, so um, I think at this point it's, it's important to start getting the trajectories right because we've, uh, heat policy has been something that's been neglected for really quite a long time. I'm not, however, disputing that um, there will be homes that have got um, boilers in for quite some time to come. And that's where it becomes important to get that efficiency right because in a developed country like ours, um, when you in install efficiency measures in um, many homes, then you don't get a, a, a huge rebound effect. Actually, you do 
get genuine savings. Not in all of them, but in uh, the majority of them. And so then you've got genuine savings on, on fossil fuel consumption. And I think what we've got with uh, our policy on the Green Deal is something that isn't ambitious enough. It isn't, it isn't driving change, particularly. And I think you know the transition, the, head, the headspace we need to get into is to realise that our domestic and commercial building stock is part of our national infrastructure. It's just got different property rights attached to it. But if you look at the work that Consumer Focus commissioned on um, uh, on insulation in the building stock, um, this is f econ just economically. We're not talking about emissions. We're not talking about equity. Just economically, it is better to be spending public money on that building stock than it is to be spending it on roads, on airports, on bridges and such like. It gives, because it gives, uh, the, the fuel that is saved gives, a, gives an injection of cash to the economy every year because of the money that, um, uh, that, that households and businesses aren't spending on gas. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I'm not sure you answered the question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> is that is that fair enough? To, um, you know, it was sort of specifically about importing, wasn't it? Really, whether it was yeah, what's the point? I mean, it, it, you're talking about a strategy that's going to take a long time. I think you're both conceding that, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. So, you you know also that we were self-sufficient in gas up until about the year 2000, and we are no longer, and that is rapidly declining from yeah. North Sea on um, gas, as we all know. So, w to my point about you know, I, would you be happy actually to see gas imported from the United States, shale gas? Rather than get it out of the ground here. Well, is I don't that, think. Is, does that make logical economic sense? I don't think it's going to, to be imported from the US. But your, uh, your question is: Are you happy to see conventional gas or, or gas imported? Um, well, we are going to be doing that. And frankly, if that means um, that we don't start exploiting fossil fuels that need to stay in the ground, yes, I think that's what we have to do. Um, it's a timing issue here. Uh, I, I agree. It is a huge. All of this is a huge challenge. We just have to sort of tick the huge challenge box, or renege on two degrees C. But if we tick the huge challenge box, uh, what we're talking about, even for a very outside chance of meeting our obligations, is basically being a pretty much a decarbonised society in the UK by about 2030. I don't think you'll get significant shale gas production in the UK any quicker than you could actually retrofit a lot of our homes. So actually. Both of those are, are problematic. At the moment, you just say we're not, we're not um, self-sufficient anymore. We get, I think, about uh, um, half, roughly half the gas is the UK, and the rest of it, uh, half of the other stuff, comes from Qatar, and the other half from Norway, as far as I understand. Um, but what we need to do is, if we're serious about climate change, is to get off that carbon curve. And we have to do that via retrofit. We have a lot of people unemployed. Uh, we have a lot of resources in this country. I think we could retrofit our housing stock about as fast <coughs> as we could probably develop the shale gas industry any, at any significant level, a significant level of penetration. If you're telling me you could probably produce very large quantities of shale gas by 2025 in our current planning regime, or you want to override the planning regime, you, you tell me one way or the other on that, then possibly it may have, a, may have a five year spell to spend in the UK, but that would be a massive stranded asset if you build the shale gas infrastructure then close it down in five years' time, or when they only two degrees C. Um, just, can I pick up on something that Francis um, Egan said a little bit earlier? And he said um, it was about supply and demand, didn't he? He said and about um, you know supplying it where it's demanded. So you know that if you supply it here in the UK, it doesn't have to go so far. So therefore, it does have an impact, doesn't it, or on, on emissions in, in a good way. Well, not in a better way. <laughs> well, firstly, uh, only if it's not go not going to be used somewhere else. I mean, uh, certainly, I, I take the view that if we produced it in the UK, even with the cuts to the Environment Agency, that it would be much better to produce... If you, if you park climate change, let's, yeah. let's provide, provide, pretend that Nigel Lawson and Peter Lilly are right, and that climate change is, is, a, is a myth. If you park that, then I'm sure that using gas produced in the UK, in the same way producing oil produced from which farm in Dorset, is much better than bringing it in from elsewhere in the world. I think our regulatory regime is, is pretty good in this country, not as good as it could be, but it's a pretty good regime. We'll monitor it relatively well, and particularly if it's on land, I think our offshore industry is, is a little bit more tenuous in terms of links to regulation. But um, if it's on land, I think we'd be, we would control it pretty well. So yes, it would be better to have it here than to bring it in on the Russian gas, gas line from whatever the Russians are doing at the other end. But the problem is, if we burn the gas here, are we saying that we won't be doing it at the, at the Russian end? Of course we're not. We're going to do it at the Russian end and at our end. So I, I, I think we have to sort of again come to the aggregates, not, not, not the bits. We have to look at the big mm. system here. Okay. Do you want to pick up on that? Yeah. Um, yes, you had a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I will come to you, I promise you. Mark Lappin from uh, Dart Energy. First of all, thanks for coming along. Those of us who've stood in audiences like this uh, with, uh, facing the activists know that it isn't always comfortable. Um, so genuinely, thanks for coming along. 
makes the debate more interesting. I think the argument we're having here, or trying to have here, is about the transition. Um, I don't imagine there are many climate change deniers in the audience. From what I've heard, and I'd just like to see if you could confirm it, is you've said we need to make this transition. There's a major investment in infrastructure. Uh, we will got, become increasingly dependent upon imported gas through that time. So I think what you're saying is we need to make the transition. It's going to be painful, and we should do it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Short and sweet. Hi, uh, Rizwan Isap, Dow Microbial Control. One of the advantages of shale gas as opposed to sustainables is the benefits to wider industry and to the country as a whole. Um, from our calculations, every one dollar of gas of shale gas that comes out of the ground, the American economy benefits to the tune of eight dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. And like we heard this morning, only between a quarter and a third of shale gas would actually be used for energy. The rest of it would be used for feedstocks, which would mean that companies wouldn't would stay in well in the country in the U.S. or the U.K. rather than shipping jobs out to countries where manufacturing is a lot cheaper and a lot more polluting. Um, what's your response to this? I mean, the energy we'd get from sustainables, where would the other $7 to the economy, or where's the wider benefit to the economy coming from? And in the meantime, the transition, where does the money for the transition come from? Thank you. Well, I think it's fair to say this is pretty much moving outside of our realm of an expertise, so I can take my professor hat off altogether here. Um, how do we deal with this? If, if, if the numbers you say are completely correct, where, where do we get this extra money from? I don't think we're short of resources. As I repeatedly say, we, we seem to, when we need it, we seem to find billions, hundreds of billions, at, at, at the drop of a hat. Now, some of that money may be digital, but um, some of it's actually real. Um, so we, we, we find those billions. We're not short of the billions that we require to put in the into the infrastructure to change it. So I, I don't think necessarily that our, if we hadn't discovered shale gas, you're telling us every developed country in the world would, would, would collapse, that shale gas somehow is this miracle cure, and that we were otherwise on some, some sort of um, inevitable decline. I don't think that's clearly, that's clearly not the case. There are other things that we can do. Shale gas may well be helping in the US economy. Um, I'm not sure what the dollar impact is on the, on the uh, coastal strip of Bangladesh, and until you do those sums, you can't say how, how the impacts are globally on this. Um, but I just, I just say we're not short of resources to bring about the transitions we, that we need to make. What we're, short, what we're short of is the courage, the will, the innovate, innovative ability and the imagination to think differently about the problem that we are now facing. So I accept broadly what you're saying, but I think there are other ways to skin that cat. Um, let me uh, just tackle I think this is a question about what what is the UK economy destined to look like and where are we going to put our energies? Uh, what are we going to try and uh, try and achieve collectively? Um, now, one way of looking at it is just to say um, it's not up to us. It's up to you know whatever uh, whatever people who, uh, who who want to start businesses and do things in the UK want to do. But I think there's there's now quite a body of evidence that says if you're if you're developing into new technologies and new areas, actually you do need something where um, the state is horror phrase picking winners. Um, the state is actually uh, having to be involved in the sort of transitions that need to take place. Now, we have a number of options for that. Um, marine renewables is one. I've already talked about the benefits to the economy of, uh, of a retrofit program. Um, the analysis Cambridge Econometrics did said that um, in terms of um, the UK economy, and again, that's not that's not energy. That's the entire UK economy. Um, going for offshore wind instead of gas-fired generation is beneficial to the UK economy um, by about 0.8 GDP, and that's uh, that's robust to quite a lot of different sensitivities, including exploitation of shale gas. So. Um, there are options that we have for what our future economy would look like, and I think it's important to be clear that we want an economy, and we should be aiming for an economy, that is robust to the challenges that are going to face us in the 21st century, of which climate change is an overriding one.
Okay, go, go ahead. Come back with a, it's always good to have a little bit of disagreement on the floor, I think. Um, I, okay. I, I don't think we should be, um, and maybe this isn't quite what you're suggesting, that we should necessarily be picking winners as governments. We've been picking winners for years and we almost always pick the one that comes in last or, or falls at the first hurdle. Um, I think what we should be doing as governments is, are setting the standards, the regulatory framework, and I, I, I'm in here actually emission standards, and, and, and I don't like four-wheel drive cars, I don't like most people that drive them either, um, but with, with those sorts of cars, I don't care if people drive them or not, as long as they really are going to meet 100 grams of, of CO2 per kilometre. So we just set the standard and let the, let the, in this case, let market, let the technologies deliver. So if we set the standard for, for electricity generation in the UK and, and, and shale gas industry can deliver that, then fine. I don't think there's any evidence at all if we set the standard in relation to 2 degrees C that the shale gas industry or any other fossil fuel industry could deliver. But, but I, I'm, I wouldn't want to stop them. If they can deliver it, then that is perfectly reasonable to do. It's not our job to pick winners. It's our job to set the standards for the things that we want to avoid. In this case, it would, say, be climate change. Um, and come one, one other point back on your, your comment before, I think, is that, that even if we do go down a, a shale gas route, one of the concerns I have is, is actually price volatility. Now, I don't know whether shale gas means we won't have price volatility. We, don't, we always seem to have fossil fuel gas, fossil fuel price volatility. That is very bad for industry. And actually, the, the more you can reduce demand, the less susceptible you are to, to price volatility. So I think there are, again, concerns about going down this particular route. I think there are other things that we can do that, that would have other ticks. So it would help the volatility issue. You could help with fuel poverty. There are lots of other issues that I think, by going down the, the, the sort of demand route, rather than necessarily the supply route, if you really had to go down one or the other, um, it would probably deliver better returns for, for for society as a whole, maybe not just the economy, but for society as a whole. Okay, another, go on. Sorry. Back to you. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Praveen Thank Martis, you. Endeavour Energy. Uh, Kevin, I take your points. Some of them are uh, quite interesting and uh, definitely worthy of, uh, you know, thinking these things through. But uh, on a very practical level, I think, um, you know, if, if we don't develop UK shale gas, on a practical level, it's uh, it's surely going to come from, from different sources. I mean, there's over 900 TCF of gas in Qatar and, you know, equivalent amount in, in Iran and there are other regimes where, you know, they've got less restraints on developing this gas and, and bring it ac across. And surely the economic <laughs> rationale will mean we burn gas, for, you know, in the next few years, at least 10-15 ten, ten, years, and uh, it'll be to the detriment of, of the UK industry. So what, what, what would happen is we don't uh, develop our, a local re uh, resource, we just substitute it for something uh, from abroad. And, and again, when you look at it, 900 TCF and 1,000 TCF, these are huge amounts of gas. And, you know, we, we're still uncertain about the amounts in the UK, 200 TCF, they say. The recovery could fall down as low as, you know, it, it, all it takes is, you know, a few well tests to, to bring down uh, reserves. So realistically, what it would mean is it would destroy a whole industry without it even giving a chance to compete. With, with something from abroad. And uh, on a practical level, I think it could do a lot of harm uh, than good. Well, I mean, what you're doing is pointing out the importance of an international agreement on all this stuff. Um, now, um, the, the dynamics of the international uh, discussions on climate, I won't credit them with the term negotiations at this point, um, uh, there is a critical importance of the EU because without China and the US coming to some kind of agreement then it's going to be a pretty tricky uh, and um, the EU is by most independent analysts uh, assessment um, pretty critical to making that work so um, that dynamic needs to be made to work it's not always worked very well in the past but uh, as I've alluded to with the World Bank study and what, uh, what Kevin's been pointing out, um, we need to try really hard. Now, the UK is still in the EU. The UK is still a major player uh, in that place, and we actually welcomed the UK's uh, government's ambition for saying um, we want to aim for a 50% uh, cut in CO2 emissions across Europe. Um, not because it's perfect, but because it's better than... Uh, um, anybody else seems to want to put on the table. So the UK making what happens in those international negotiations has got, as I say, has got to be made to work. Now, you're saying realistically we can't do anything else. Well, I would say realistically if we don't do anything else, we're buggered. So that's a different form of realism. Uh, what I think the realism is, is that we've got to escape from a short-termist uh, approach to these critical energy and climate issues. Because if we don't, we're going to be in, living in a reality that is frankly pretty unpleasant. 
Yeah. Go on. Again, it's one of those questions that includes uh, or, or, or touches on a lot of issues. I think your question really, to some extent, is aimed at as much at Dan and at the government or the parliamentary process as it is, at, as it is as, at us. You know, we have signed up to certain commitments. If, if, if we actually mean it when we sign up to them, and um, you know, I think we should do, or not sign up to them, then we have to have phased out the use of gas, whether imported or not imported, by about 2030. Now, I don't think shale gas can make a significant contribution in that time frame. Particularly, if you do, I mean, you might be able to start making a contribution significantly by 2025, but then you've got to stop using it by 2030, which I say would be a, a poor use of your resources, that would be a massive stranded asset. So it comes back to what we've actually signed up to internationally. And, and you use the word economic, and I'm going to again, it's slightly unusual, I went perhaps, but to unpick that a little bit. Economic comes from the, from the, the Greek term oikonomia, which is stewardship of the household. And if the household is the planet, if you're economic, then you wouldn't be going down this particular route. I think you mean the more common version of economics, which is crematistics from the, from the Greek, I'm probably pronouncing it all wrong, but broadly crematistics, which is the making of money. So there's a difference between economics and finance. If we're really worried about our own futures, the futures of other people on the planet, our own children, that's about the economy. That's about economics. If we're worried about finance and getting a buck in our pocket, then that is perhaps the, the, the economics you may be talking about. And if we're worried about the former, which is, I think is the role of government for us as citizens to, to, to be more worried about, then I think it is very clear from an economic perspective you would not pursue shale gas in the UK.